reading from 1st John chapter 1 verses 1 through 4. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. These are inspired words for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A reading from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you hold others, they are held. But Thomas, who was called a twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. These are inspired words for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations on all our hearts be a blessing to you, O Lord, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. Amen. So this week, there may have been many important things in the news, but I was paying attention to uh, an interesting story that played out regarding um, images, social media, and how we present ourselves. So Khloe Kardashian, one of the stars of the reality TV show Keeping Up with the Kardashians, tried to have a photo of herself removed from social media. You see, the picture was not authorized by her. She hadn't approved it. It was put up by mistake by uh, somebody who was helping her out with social media. The picture showed her as a beautiful woman, gorgeous, in a lovely background with a lovely smile on her face, enjoying herself. But she didn't want that picture distributed because it wasn't edited. Yeah, it wasn't edited, it wasn't filtered, it wasn't controlled by her. It wasn't the way that she wanted to be seen. It wasn't the story that she tells about herself. Now, this is kind of a complicated story for me because I hate the idea that she is followed by millions of young girls and that she always presents herself edited, filtered. She is CGI'd to a point of not being much of herself. However, I give her so much credit and applaud her and so many others for the honesty that they have about um, putting their pictures out as manipulated. They say right from the beginning, this is edited, this is filtered, this is the light that I want on me, this is the way that I wanna be presented. 
Um, and it is not the way that I was taught about how we hide the ways that we make ourselves, you know, a little bit more beautiful. When I, and I'm totally showing my age now, but I remember TV commercials about does she or doesn't she, because nobody talked about the fact that we might not have our hair this natural color. Or no, our cheeks really are always pink like this. Um, or after being in the closet, rummaging through things, finding just the perfect outfit, trying on a hundred things, we might say something like, oh, I just threw this together when I came over to see you. We weren't very honest about um, the ways that we wanted to hide our true selves and show a more beautiful self. One of my favorite TV shows has a clip that shows this to the extreme. I hope you'll enjoy this clip from Mrs. Maisel and understand the extremes that people sometimes go through to not be themselves. Festive but deadly. <laughs> Good night, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. <laughs> morning. Ooh. Didn't the alarm go off? It sure did. Oh, wow, I didn't hear it at all. You never do. So why is it so hard for us to be real about who we are? Why is it so hard for us to name our humanity in all of its less than beautiful ways? Well, Jesus spends some really important time in the gospel today, helping us understand the way that we should share our humanness and who we are and all that we have gone through. Now, it's a little bit less about um, using filters and Photoshop, and it's a little bit more about recognizing what we have been through and how we rise up from it. And Jesus reminds us that it's hard Rising up can be hard. So what is it that makes it hard for us to be human, to share our humanness, to share our mess ups, to share the ways that we've really, really suffered, we've really created problems? And I'm guessing it has a lot to do with shame, being vulnerable, and giving room for others to judge us and to maybe harm us with that information. And even if our perfection story is not our true story, it's the one that we tell the world with middle of the night makeup or Instagram filters, it's a story that helps us 
it keeps us, frankly, from dealing with emotions related to our loss, our failures, guilt, shame, sadness, all those things that come when we're dealing with really hard falls in our lives. Marriages ending, children being arrested, losing our job, addiction, and losses like the death of a loved one, a mother, a sister, or guilt around causing huge problems, you know, causing a company to go under, causing a car accident. But if we bury those emotions and eliminate them from the story we tell and edit and filter them out of the picture, we are not telling the world who we are. And we miss out on a big opportunity to follow Jesus into truth. It's hard. Rising up is hard. And being honest about that rising is also hard. We don't recover from these things in a day, in a moment, sometimes not even in a lifetime. Sometimes the work of dealing with those emotions, those failures, dealing with receiving forgiveness, needing forgiveness, forgiving others, all of that work that we do to come back from something is a lot. Yet that work is work that everybody needs to do. And when we show the before and the after, just like a HGTV home unveiling show where they speed up really quickly, a million people coming in and fixing up the house and then show the beautiful after, it misses the work and people don't understand and people are lost and people will give up. We may find ourselves like the disciples hiding behind locked doors when we are in those states of loss and suffering. Avoiding friends, family, becoming more distant, not letting people see us in this state. We don't want to be seen crying or having an anxiety attack. We skip going to the beach because of the way we look in the bathing suit. We don't go out at night anymore because we don't want to let anyone know we can't drive. Our night vision isn't what it used to be. And it may be really useful during the depths of those challenging moments to retreat. We all understand that. To do some deep thinking and do it facing our emotions, looking at our reactions, and examining that with people with whom we feel safe, that we can do that. And like Jesus, who we hear in these scriptures, who had both scars that were healing and open wounds, there's a process of healing that we might not be ready to be seen and share. But we need to make sure that is part of our story too. So that when we do make ourselves visible, our full story can be shared and known. Because if we stay hidden, if we stay isolated, if we give power to the shame, to the false stories that we tell ourselves, that we are just the worst of who we have ever been, that we are our failure, we are our loss, then we will never be testifying to our faith and our belief in resurrection. But when we find ourselves confronting them, learning from them, and moving on ultimately past them, we free ourselves to be examples of God's gracious work of restoration in each and every person's life and the possibility and the hope for that in each and every person's life. As one of my favorite preacher says, Billy Honor says, he says, we open ourselves to the possibility that our test can become our testimony. I love that. In these powerful appearance stories of Jesus after crucifixion in the Gospel of John, Jesus begins to confront the damage of the crucifixion. And what I love about it is that he also shows us how to deal with the messiness of our lives and how we rise from that mess and that it's hard. <laughs> 
undoubtedly there are going to be many stories. We can imagine the stories that the disciples are telling themselves after the resurrection, after the crucifixion, when they are hiding in the upper room. These are stories that we tell ourselves. These are the stories about our own vulnerabilities, our own issues. You may have the same thing. If somebody starts to call and have say, I want to talk to Brenda. This is really important. Something serious is going on. I immediately go to, I messed up. Not that somebody needs me, that somebody has a question, that somebody else messed up and they need to deal with it. I immediately go to my story is, my default story is I messed up and someone's mad at me because of it. That's the work that I need to do in the mess, examining where that comes from. Why do I tell that story first when I don't know for sure what's going on? That first story is a false story. And I bet that disciples had their own first stories, false stories too. You can imagine Nathaniel wondering if maybe he was an idiot to give up and follow this man who dies as a failure because everybody wondered if he wasn't a little bit of an idiot. At least that's what he thinks. That's the story he tells himself. Maybe James was wondering if his faith just wasn't enough to pull Jesus through this because that was James' story. I just don't have enough faith. I have too many questions. I have, I have to work harder at my faith. Peter Peter looking at those denials that he made the night of Jesus' arrest and keeps telling himself, I did it. I'm the cause. It's all me. And not looking at the bigger picture. We have these false stories we tell ourselves in the midst of our failures, in the midst of our losses. And those are the stories that we need to confront and say, hmm, what really happened? Hmm. What really, really, really is the way that we're going to get past this? And it's not paying attention to the false stories. I need to look at the truth of where I got to and how I got there. And how do I rise from it? Rising is hard. This is hard work, friends. And we get it. But Jesus shows us in these beautiful scripture passages how we get through it. So while the disciples might have been hiding away in a locked room, trying to avoid being seen, Jesus does not hide or avoid them. He comes in through all barriers, maybe even locked doors, and reveals himself, makes himself and his wounds known to those who didn't stand with him and maybe even denied him. The beauty of the story is that he eliminates those false narratives and tells the truth. Something awful happened and it is this that we need to deal with. And he shows them what the this is, the scars. He tells them the story of the pain, the humiliation, the betrayal, the fear, and he provides them with a breath of God's spirit, strengthening them so that they can hear it, they can confront it, they can talk about it, they can come to the truth of what happened and figure out then how they're going to learn and move, move on. And they do that, thank you, to Thomas. In our gospel reading today, Thomas is now present the second time Jesus visits his disciples in the upper room. And he offers up, Jesus offers up to Thomas immediately the thing that Thomas had told the disciples he would need. I will need to see his wounds in his hand. I will need to touch the scar in his side. And Jesus walks in and does that immediately. See my hands, touch my side. Many people think that this is Thomas's story of doubt. We even call him Doubting Thomas. My question is maybe he just wanted the full story. He wanted to see the, the rise, 
You see, it wouldn't have been arising from suffering, from pain, from betrayal, from loss, from humiliation. It wouldn't have been arising a resurrection from that if Jesus wasn't showing the scars, the marks, if he wasn't real about what he had been through and what he had known and now made that his story. Thomas wants to know the Jesus who had been with them throughout all of his time in Galilee and had endured the suffering, moved through the process of forgiving and moving to the other side. I can't imagine what that kind of wounding, physical wounding, would look like. But for Thomas, it was pure beauty. It was the fullness of the story that we all hope for. That is part of the resurrection story, that it gives us hope that we can rise from our own failures, that we can rise up from the things that have taken us down, the losses, the grief, the embarrassment. We can come back from it, but we're not the same. We are not the same and we know that we have the scars and Jesus shows us that he has the scars. He's been through it. We can get through it. That is the hope that we have, but we do it embracing the beauty of that story, the fullness of that story, who we are because of those scars. Many people have found this art form from ancient uh, Japan that tells us that we can appreciate the beauty of broken pieces put back together, of scarred lives, the history of that. And they do it through the way they create or recreate pottery. Our culture finds it very important that we understand the spiritual backgrounds or the history uh, behind the person or the material. This is the Kintsugi project. Kin is gold. Tsugi is a connect, but actually connect to the world, connect to the generation. I'm Telo Kurosaki, and the producer or organizing of this project. There's uh, some traditional uh, technique, skills, uh, in Japan, 400 years, 500 years, or joined together with a, not glue, with a lacquer, and then gold leaf on top. My name is Muniak Shimode. I'm a craftsman from Kyoto. I am to name myself the third Bison, which is my family craftsman name after my father dies. Now I am learning from my father about this traditional skill. This idea of fixing broken things comes from the spiritualism in our culture. We have the sense of wabi-sabi, which means uh, to find beauties in uh, broken things or old things. This uh, fixing with lacquer and our skill uh, is the ancient wisdom of our ancestors. The importance in Kintsugi is not the physical appearance. It is more likely the beauty and the importance stays in the one who is looking at the dish, not the dish itself. The beauty of Kintsugi is that we see in the scars hope that we can put the pieces back together, but they are part of the story of breaking. They are part of the story of coming apart because coming apart and coming back together is the story of rising up. It's our story and it's our hope because of Jesus' resurrection, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, we can rise up. Jesus wants those rising stories to be the story that we tell. He tells those disciples, 
I have breathed on you. This is your story now to share. Your story of brokenness, my story of brokenness, and how God is with us through the brokenness, through the process of healing, back into the rising, and we have that hope each and every day. Our rising stories, like Jesus' story, have the power to inspire others if we choose to let them, if we choose to tell them, if we choose not to filter them out, if we choose not to hide behind doors until we're perfect again. Perhaps these are the most important words that we can tell. I have risen up, but before I tell you my rising story, let me show you my scar. Let me tell you what happened. Jesus chooses to make himself visible and in so doing gives hope to the somewhat hopeless followers of his time and our rising stories can do the same. That's our challenge. Rising up, even though it's hard, and talking about it. Testifying to the resurrection. Amen.